Hi guys, uh, welcome to the latest installment of the Anatomy of Style. Uh, this week we're going to look at the illusion of the third dimension. Now on a piece of paper we know it only has two dimensions, up and down and left and right. Uh, we can't go into the paper. So we have to create an illusion and we do that using tonal value. Uh, tone and value uh, sometimes intertwined is the same thing. Uh, we usually talk about tone being different from value when it's color. Uh, and hue is brought in as you know a darker version of blue for instance. So they're interchangeable some way. Uh, what we're going to talk about really about the tonal value is how dark a value is. How dark a gray is. It uh, goes right into the darkest black and through the values comes out as the, the, the highest light which is white. So we're going to work with that today. We're going to work with tonal value and uh, to describe uh, an illusion. And also to help describe that illusion, we'll also use overlap in forms. Uh, when one form appears to overlap another form, especially on the human body in a drawing, it appears to be uh, more dimensional and no longer lives on the two-dimensional page. We feel that it's uh, we could take it off the page, we could lift it off the page. Our eyes are tricked and we believe now in the third dimension on a two-dimensional form, the paper. Okay, well that's the theory out of the way. So let's have a look at what we're going to do today. We're going to try to create that illusion on the human figure. And this portion is the body landscape, I've named it. And we're going to use the body as a landscape of overlapping forms and create the illusion of depth and I will take you through that right now. So let's get started. Okay, so here we go. Now you can see my little uh, willow charcoal there. I've shaved it into the shape of a little witch's hat uh, using a sandpaper block. You can just buy sandpaper from the hardware store and use that or even staple a piece onto a small piece of wood, but you can buy them in the art store, the sandpaper blocks, and they're convenient. So I have a, a, a load of those, a little bunch of those that I keep in various tins to sharpen my little willow charcoals. Okay, so I'm going to draw with uh, this little witch's hat. It's so versatile. If you turn it on its edge, it gets a very sharp line like you see in there, and I can put it down on its flat. I need to and get a broader tone. So a very, really beautiful way to work for it. So fluid and you can see by using the gestural grip there, with the two fingers holding the charcoal piece and underhand grip, I can work from my shoulder right down my arm and pivot at the wrist. Uh, you can turn your hand in positions that are just impossible using the writing grip, the detail hand with the pen over the top of your pan between finger and thumbs. So this underneath grip is, is just essential to draw with fluidity for me. Alright, so you can see I'm putting in the, the big shapes first as always, but what I'm looking for here is a tilt. I always look to see a tilt, even if I can't find it. And here the shoulders, because of the scapula, the shoulders work independently, and so our natural instinct is to tilt toward the weight burn leg, which is the the leg longest uh, taking the weight of the body uh, but with the scapula which holds which houses the shoulders and all the muscles that go with it they can actually move up and down independently so with Alana here it, it feels like it's a symmetrical pose but it's not really and the clue to find which way the shoulders would tilt if um, if we just dropped our arms right down without using the scapula would be to look for the pinch on the on the waist and you can see the pinch is on the left hand side there and so that pinch tells us that that leg is pushing up against the rib cage and that the rib cage is tilted to the left and that's how we know that's a, a rib cage tilt and so we have a contrapostal pose that may not at first glance look that way uh, now I'm chasing rhythms here something we'll talk about in length uh, in another more advanced uh, portion of these these movies. 
Uh, but it's worth looking at now just as a, a teaser and it's basically following the form down the body in rhythms and I'm always thinking about uh, what's on the other side of the leg as I draw one side and what's on the other side of the rib cage and so I'm always thinking from side to side it's a very simple thought and hard to maintain because our natural instinct is to is to draw detail and what we see and, and move down the body drawing detail it's very hard to break out of when you begin but uh, it holds me my work in good stead to keep that discipline in place so disciplines are very important to me and I know it sounds like the opposite of art a discipline but basically there's laws of nature and laws of nature tell us that these forms have to interlock at certain points uh, whether the proportion matters or not, that's a different thing because we have long torsoed people and short torsoed people and long legged people and short legged people so the proportions don't matter that much but there's no doubt that the nose is above the lips and we can't break that law of nature so I'm working with the laws of nature <laughs> that being said, if you're Picasso you can do anything you like so if you're working in abstract uh, forms then that's fine but if we're figurative artists we have to at least have some discipline toward the laws of nature. And you can see um, that practice in place now. I'm, when I draw that shoulder, I go over and draw the other shoulder. And I feel that that gives me a rhythm. And the rhythm continues on. And if I break that rhythm, my drawing usually falls apart a little bit. So the disciplines are really important to me in that they keep me, well, disciplined but they keep me in check to what makes one artwork work and one artwork fail and it's usually because I've lost the rhythm and rhythm is really the, for me we're getting into the core of what makes great art and it is the gesture and the rhythm is all part of gesture and we can call gesture many things but certainly rhythm is one of those things and gesture is the is the fluidity of drawings, the, the lines that run between the forms and over the forms. And so as I draw from side to side, I feel that constant rhythm and gesture. And, uh, and it's, it's beautiful. It's a wonderful feeling. If we were to use the sight method, and like I say, I don't teach it, but there's nothing wrong with it. But if we, if we measure everything with string or holding up our thumbs, we, we break that rhythm. And for me, the broken rhythm is, is just, um, it's not worth the price of getting things accurate. And you'll see in this drawing that I will manage to get this pretty accurate, even though it's not important to me. And the way to do that is to, uh, to work with, with relationships. What, what is next to what else? You know, what's the distance measuring by eye between these two scapula, for instance? You know, I can see that, and it's basically a neck. And with those relationships in mind, it's very well, it's easier to get proportion in. And proportion is important to a degree, and I believe that you should learn your proportion so well that you don't have to think about it. And so I've, you know, went to great lengths to try and understand how these things proportionally sit uh, in order for me to draw with confidence without measuring. You know, I know that the scapula is a hand long, that's the art, the model's hand, and a hand wide. So you can look at hands uh, to get proportions. But I really want to work with more often than not the relationships. Because I think if you work with the relationships, the proportions can pretty much take care of themselves. And so another good proportion actually from the back here is that if you get up to the pinch where the pinch is and uh, on the left hand side where the rib cage meets the obliques, if you find that pinch and then measure by eye up to the shoulder and then measure by eye down to the, the bottom of the gluteus, it's kind of close to the same distance. You know, we'd err on the torso top made a little longer, but on certain pinches it's very close, it's very similar. So if you get in that kind of ballpark, then you're going to do okay. You're going to get a, a good proportion there. All right, so I'm feeling uh, the rhythm of this 
and really this is my favorite part of the drawing to be honest you just put in the the rhythmic strokes is is one of it's just the the most freeing part of drawing this is when we're totally free uh, in the gestural stage and note here how the gluteus uh, are different shapes if we have the we look at the left hand side of the leg, that gluteus line, the gluteal line or fold, let's say, let's call the center of the line and the, and the pressured bottom part, the, the fold. And so the gluteal fold is being pressured and straightened out because of the biceps femoris, which is the, the big leg uh, muscle at the back. I'm going to call both of those the, the biceps because one's called the semitendinosus and they're funny little names and they're funny long names that we don't really need to adhere to. Uh, so the semi-tendinosis in the inside. Let's call both of those the biceps. Uh, don't want people riding in. <laughs> so he doesn't know a semi-tendinosis from his biceps femoris. Uh, it's really not that important. You can call them the the, um, the top leg muscles if you like at the back. Whatever you like. And big baseball bat muscles for the calves. And I often think of it like that, which is a, a mnemonic. And a mnemonic's easier to remember than a name. So I'll think about those shapes, uh, like for instance the gluteus, and I'll get onto that later. But while I've got it in mind, a mnemonic for the gluteus for me is a butterfly. And it's not my idea. Uh, I got that from um, from reading lots of different sources. And I think it was it was Peck, I think was the, the guy who was great with mnem mnemonics, a really old book. Uh, some might see it as a dusty old book, but you know, compared to most modern books, it's still a classic, uh, still relevant. And that's a great thing about figure drawing is it's, it's always relevant. Uh, the things you'll learn here are forever. You know, we're not going to change how we look evolutionary wise over our lifetime. You know, people are getting taller, but the laws of nature are still the same. We're still, you know, a nose is still above a mouth. And these interlocking forms still interlock at the same points. So all of this, and like I say, those old books are really still, uh, you know, for me, the Bibles of, of uh, illustration. Peck and Loomis and, and Hogarth. And hopefully I'm adding just my, my humble notation to that with my books as well. So read broadly and find the best. Okay, so... A little swirl in the hair there is, is helping me find that gesture. If you, if you lose your gesture every once in a while, just just get into the hair or something that maybe if, if there's a bit of cloth in the picture, get in there and swirl around a little and it'll help you maintain the, the gestural flow. So here we are. I'm putting in that little mnemonic of the, the butterfly. I'm thinking about it anyhow. And note how I'm aware of anatomy too. So we've got these shapes, but we've also got anatomy. So it's a lifetime of learning. And the anatomy tells me that, uh, the anatomy clues tell me that if I want to get that shape in, uh, in correct uh, proportion by the laws of nature, then I have to be aware of where the great trochanter bone uh, inserts into the side of the, the torso. And it inserts into between the gluteus medius and the gluteus maximus. And so if we take the gluteal line at the center between the gluteus and we just come down a notch, then that's basically where the great trochanter uh, ends, at the very tip of it, because on the other side that equates with the pubic arch. So you can see the great trochanter on the right leg as a peak below the gluteus, and it's coming down into the body and going uh, up into the gluteus as well at that, at that point. And so it's the widest part of the hips uh, beginning there. And it usually carries on down below the gluteus as being the widest part. Sometimes it's spot on or close to it. But usually you can't go wrong if you just drop that below the gluteus as the widest part of the hips. And it'll always read. And on to other anatomy here. I'm thinking about um, all the beautiful muscles that, that add to gesture. You know, the gastrocnemius here. And, uh, and also the highs and lows. You can see I'm marking some little points for you to understand that the outside of the leg, uh, the calf muscle is higher than the inside of the leg, for instance. 
and that continues pretty much up the leg if you look for it. You might have to slant a little bit here or there, but basically if you think about the outside being high and the inside being low, uh, that's, that's going to work for you on the legs. And also think about the legs coming inward toward the body. So we've got a kind of pyramid upside down uh, way about the legs. And that helps us balance because the actual femur goes in and attaches onto the ilium inside the gluteus and so really the point of balance is, is deeper inside and so that's why the legs are coming inward to balance not on the outside but in the inside a little. So here's that mnemonic of the upside down butterfly. So you're thinking about the little wings on the top and the big wings on the bottom and that does that's a great mnemonic and I don't know where I picked that one up from uh, could have been Peck I'm not sure but um, it's a beauty and what it does is also tells you the corners of the body so once we see the great trochanter go in we're thinking about the, the side of the leg and once we see the gluteus uh, the change of the gluteus we know we're at the back the gluteus maximus are at the back and the gluteus medius are on the side going around to the um, front a little bit so that's a big corner a big moment and we'll talk about the gluteus a lot because the gluteus, if I was to say study one part of the body, especially the female uh, body, for how to create dimension, then you'll find it in the gluteus because the gluteus has everything. It has overlapping forms. One gluteus will over overlap the other. It has the three shadows. It has um, a core shadow where the, f the shadow is on the soft corner. So I think about a corner, if you want to think about core. has a drop shadow, where the gluteus is has overlapped the biceps to the point where it can drop a, a, an actual cast shadow, a drop shadow. It drops a shadow. And also it has an occlusion shadow, where flesh meets flesh, which is in the fold and also in the, in the gluteal line. And so all three shadows are there, and with the highlight, that creates dimension or an illusion of it. And uh, you can find that throughout the body, but that's the most obvious. So t keep that in mind and have a look at the gluteus now and see how much more dimensional it is compared to anywhere else on the figure. And it's because of those shapes. It's because it catches the light so well. And if we tame those three shadows, the occlusion, the drop, and the core shadows, if we learn to understand and, and work with those shadows, then we... Uh, we're thinking dimensionally, we're thinking of dimension and add overlapping forms to that and really you've, you've created it, the illusion, which is what we're working on now. Oh yeah, on that point uh, we're on the outside of the leg, you slant down inwards for the inside of the leg as far as forms are concerned to get a rhythm, it changes at the bottom and if you look now down at the ankle you can see that the ankle is high on the inside and low on the outside. So most things are going to be high on the outside and low on the inside, but the um, and that's with the arms as well. If you look at that big brachialis muscle on the outside of the arm, you see that inside in the forearm it's lower. So I think of that constant high and low on the outsides of the body, except for the ankles. Uh, the ankles just do that little swap around to throw us off, and of course it's all about hydraulics. It's all going to help us um, balance. That's what it's all about. So we can't have everything but not too bad. Now also look um, at the top of the gluteal line, so the center of the gluteus, and look at that pad that I've drawn in, that little triangle. That's quite rounded at the top. It's going in toward the body, and that's why the gluteus is highlighted. It's highlighted in the top because it's a ledge. So I often think of the gluteus as a box with soft forms attached to it. Uh, I don't draw it that way, but I think of it that way. So that sacrum, uh, that's what that pad is, it has two dimples, and the dimples represent the iliac crest on the back, and the ilium is basically the, the structure, the hip structure, where our legs attach, and above that the obliques attach, and around the front the abdominals attach. Uh, so it's a big fulcrum, it's the big center of the body, and once again that's why the gluteus are such an important mass. They are really the first thing we see on a figure like this and they do so much to balance the, the, the whole figure and place it in space uh, along with the dimension. 
So here's another thing I use to find dimension. I find these drop shadows and drop them onto the form. I usually sharpen them a little bit and that it adds to the dimensional quality. If you look at statues, the they already have that by their black and white nature. You tend to see these shadows easier. On color, um, working with a color photo here, for instance, or just looking at people who are have lots of color in them, then we're talking about um, being confused sometimes with the hue instead of the value. So a hue is a color. If you get a very dark blue, it might look like it's got a value that's dark in it and it, well in some ways it has but if you work and use just your blue to get a dark shadow it's not going to read in black and white it'll if you reverse the image to black and white it wouldn't look the way a good tonal value would look so i like to think about um, value uh, the whole way through even if i'm working in color i never lean on the chroma the actual color to give me the values. And I do work in color, of course, uh, but I'm very aware of that. And it's a hard thing to get across, but basically, if you ever see an artwork that seems very saturated and blinding, but doesn't seem to have any depth to it, uh, that's that's the use of color over, over tonal value that uh, creates that poor illusion. That said, art's art, and you can do that, and that might be what you're going for. But if you want to create dim dimension, we have to think about the tonal qualities, the 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 grays, if you like, or the dark um, tones from the darkest dark to the lightest light, uh, ref without using color as that as that leader. Uh, we want to think of the tone. Now, if you want to find these shadows and these tones, uh, you can squint your eyes and see what's the most important. Because what we tend to do is to think about putting all the tonal value in. There's about six or seven ranges of tone there, from a black to a grayish black to a less grayish black and to a dark gray and then a grayish mid-tone and, you know, on and on. And if we get that, it gets muddy. And I find, as we're looking at it now, I'm plotting out what is the most important darks in there. You know, what are the most important values? and I want to kill a few of those steps across. And all the, the greatest artists, all the best artists I, that I've admired over the years were, were masters of that, uh, choosing which value to leave out. So if you go for, uh, for instance, just look at it now, the very, very darks are in there, and that's already a very sculptural uh, look. So the, the drawing reads as, as, as dimensional already. But if I muddy this up a little, and you'll see, the dimension starts to disappear it starts to get flat again because we start to see too much tone and not enough contrast so contrast is the key to dimension as well well there's many keys uh, but the illusion of dimension is created by the smart handling of tonal value which is of course what we're doing so everything's in place now and uh, I'm gonna just start thinking about the core shadows which are the softer shadows so I'm using my finger and it's a great tool, you know, we can use, I usually use the little finger here for the small stuff and then alternate between the you know, the bigger fingers up to the thumb. So great drawing tools, uh, we probably one of the first tools we ever used and uh, for some reason was forgotten and let go. Uh, still a great tool, one of my favorites. You know, the tactile nature, and there you can see I've changed to a bigger hand, bigger finger, <laughs> bigger finger, to get that um, that little smudge in. And you don't want to rub too hard either. We don't want to get the nature of a smudge. We want to get the the nature of a blend. And so that means you know very light touches and also blending across the form. And that's another another way to find dimension is to treat the drawing as if it is already dimensional. I'm drawing across this form with my finger as if it exists in 3D space. That's what I'm doing. So I'm feeling about rolling across these forms. And that's why I'm always aware of that idea of the body landscape. I'm thinking of it as a landscape that my finger can actually roll across on top of the hills and down again into the valleys. And uh, with that in mind, you're like really a method actor. You're starting to, to draw 
uh, what you feel. It's one of the most important things. Now look here, uh, what I've just done. There's never, it's never too late to change unless you've been working from uh, detail from start to finish. And I've decided that that leg needs to come in a little bit more to be better balanced. And not only better balanced, but more dynamic. It was feeling a little straight. And uh, because I've been working with the will of charcoal, it was an easy fix. There you go, it's fixed. And we have now the original line still there. Uh, and that's that's what's known as pentimento, which means adjustments. And you can see that in the drawings of Michelangelo, for instance, where he makes lots of changes on the fly, and uh, it adds actually energy to the drawing. So always be aware always be thinking is another one of my disciplines always be thinking if you f if you zone out and just start rendering most likely you'll start forgetting about the actual volume and the and the dimensions everything really if your drawing will start to fall apart you know how many times have we all been guilty of of rendering to the point where the drawing gets worse and worse and before you know it you've done a major fix uh, because you took your mind off you took your eye off the ball. You started thinking about render, which is the least important of all the techniques, instead of what's really important, which is the gesture on top of the structure. And add anatomy to that, and we can't really go wrong. So we go wrong when we, when we drop some of those disciplines. So you can see that I, another I love to listen to Steve Houston talk. He's one of my favorites, and and Steve often talks about um, getting acquainted uh, with the model, and that sounds a bit silly. Uh, you know, getting to know the model is not really what it means. It's getting to know the form of the model. You don't have to take the model out to dinner and and uh, buy her flowers. Uh, it means getting to know how she or he is is built. What are the what are the changes? What are the difference? What are the things that are different in this model than the than the last model you drew? Maybe a more athletic figure, maybe a, a, a softer figure. All of those little things, and maybe they got long arms or short arms. And like I say, that's why. Also, we don't have to. We don't want to be thinking all the time that everyone's eight heads high, because then you'll just draw an eight heads high character all the time, and your your drawings will not have a freshness to them, which will be lost thinking like that. So you see, I'm mostly uh, on to this point, thinking like a sculptor, and now I'm starting to put in line. So I'm starting to think of the gesture of the forms, and and this is tough. This is tough. If we if we just copy what we see, we're not going to get so much gesture. So what I have to do is say, see that uh, triceps at the back of the arm. Can I make it rounder? Can I make it more gestural? And that's a, it's a dangerous game to play because if you get it wrong, your drawing starts to look strange. It looks, to, it looks off. It can get wobbly. And that's why we need to bring structure back in. So it's the balance of structure and gesture that make everything um, work. Everything reads as fluid and confident if we can balance both of those things. And you know, sometimes I say to my class, just balance structure and gesture, I'm going home, and that's your work done. Because really, that's it. That is the whole thing. That's everything. You know, if we can balance structure and gesture, we have it. We have everything we need to make beautiful art. But the balancing of those two things is a lifetime of learning. Because shapes change. We just did the same drawing, same, like if I drew this figure a thousand times, maybe I might end up with a perfect perfectly balanced gestural and structural drawing. But I don't want to draw the same same figure in the same pose forever. So the balance of those two things is a constant challenge because everything changes as the scapula pulls back. Look at all of this, you know, bunching up of muscle upon her and against muscle. And the rhomboids up the top there and we can see the bulge of the serratus going around to the the front of the body underneath the, the scapula there. A lot of big changes just happened that uh, needs constant uh, 
revisiting, you know, uh, let's see, um, so we had a bodybuilder there, a, a big strong guy, those, those muscles wouldn't be so lean, they'd be bunching right over the top of the spine, uh, but here on Alana they're, they're very slight, and so it's more of a, more of a crinkle, rather than a big giant bulging set of, of, uh, of lumps, and so it's one of the things that makes this so feminine, such a, f a feminine idea that the top part of the body is not as large as the the male figure would have. So you can see I'm using a, also a, a scrap of paper here uh, to keep the drawing clean, and it's just another piece of, of butcher's paper, newsprint, which is what I'm working on here for these demos. The newsprint is uh, sadly not archival, uh, so you know these drawings won't last the test of time. I mean they will. I mean they'll. There's there's a um, newsprint that's 300 years old or 200 years old, things like that. So yeah, we've all found an old newspaper in our attic or somewhere from the 1960s or 50s. We can still read it. We can still see the pictures on it. So it yellows is what it does, and it becomes brittle if it's not looked after. But on in the right hands, it can last for centuries. Uh, so I have collectors that still collect my my butcher paper drawing, new newsprint. And the reason it's called butcher's paper is it's the same stuff that the butcher wraps your meat up in. It's the cheapest paper on earth, and there's no better paper. It really for smooth and fast drawing, you can't get better than that. So I was talking to a friend of mine, Des Embry, uh, recently there. He's got a great mind for solutions. And um, I was telling him that I use bleed-proof uh, paper. The, you know the marker paper that you buy? I use that uh, for finished drawings that are going to be archival and last the test of time. And using that it means I have to slow right down because just the paper just isn't as buttery. It's not as smooth. And I'm f constantly looking for a way to get a paper that's that acts like newsprint, and that's as close as I've found. But it's still not as good as newsprint. I was talking to Des, and he um, he did a little experiment, and he s sprayed fixative on the the surface of the bleedproof paper to see if it might have a, give it a little bit more uh, flow, which seems the opposite of what it would do, and and voila, it actually it actually worked. Because if anything, the bleed-proof paper is too slick. It's too slick, and uh, and it's very bright as well. So I like to gray it down a little bit with some charcoal to get this feel of uh, butcher's paper and newsprint. So that's something I'm going to experiment with a little bit more as I go uh, along my path as an artist, uh, always exploring new materials. So give that a go and see how you go with it. And make sure you always attribute it to Des Embry. Uh, he's the mastermind of that, not me. Uh, it was a wonderful little gift that I'm going to um, hold on to and see if I can make something work out of that. <coughs> so thanks for that, Des. And now I'm going to start working on these hips. And you can see the obliques. Uh, the obliques go up to the fifth rib. And so before it reaches the fifth rib, it, it of course collides with the rib cage uh, because it's on the ribs. And the bulk of the rib cage crushes against it. So the obliques are quite thick on the sides and then they become very thin as they travel on up the rib cage. So that's the point, that's a great landmark. And I used to think it was the I used to think it was the top of the hip bone. It kind of gives that an illusion. But it's the muscle on top of the hip bone. So we get a, a sort of double a double um, curve there. And I'll usually tame those curves down so they don't look like bubbles. Uh, so I, I like to get a smooth transition there as much as I can. Uh, but not too smooth where it becomes uh, wobbly. And once again, that's structure and gesture for you. you got to play them off until one works better for the other. Too much gesture is too wobbly. Too much structure is too stiff. And that's what we have to work with all the time. So I'm working now with... Uh, General's pencil. I like generals. You know, they, they're basically what they say they are. They're general, generally, you know, good workhorse pencil. They can't get as dark as the more expensive pencils like Pitt, charcoal, uh, beautiful pencil. 
and the Conte pencils. But they're they're a great little gray workhorse that can get very dark darks, just not as dark as, as uh, the more expensive ones, but dark enough. I and mean, you can see how dark that is. That's all done with a general's uh, pencil. So, but if you want midnight blacks, then you're going into the pit charcoals. So I'll work with the generals for most of the drawing. And th another thing I love about them too is that they're they're not gritty. I mean, even with Conte, one of the best pencils in the world, I often have to sharpen the pencil uh, to get grit out of it. I'll be drawing along and all of a sudden it'll hit this pit and it'll be the grit in the Conte. And so that's uh, that's a bother when you're when you're trying to stay gestural that you have to stop and sharpen your pencil. And on that note as well, guys, if you go to Life Draw, I would recommend you go with a with a whole slew of, of pencils already sharpened because you don't want to interrupt that flow. You know, life drawing sessions are usually three hours, and uh, you know it's not a lot of time. You don't want to be sp spending chunks of that sharpening your pencil. You could do that at home. I usually put my pencils as well in a, a little um, pencil case. I like the old-fashioned tins, and then I pad if I've sharpened a whole lot of pencils. I want to protect them. So I usually pad the pencils with some tissue paper. And then that's it. I've got my little tin of pencils. Same with the the little charcoal sticks. I sharpen all those and put them in a separate a separate pencil case. So I usually not case, they're they're crazy when I see uh, cases being sold to hold pencils, soft cases. No, it's just gets broken. It's every, when you bring it take it out, it's all all busted. So I prefer the, to make my own little tins, uh, and you can find tins in anything. You don't have to go to an art store. In fact, they don't sell them, I don't think. They'll sell you pencils that are already in a tin, and then save that tin, I guess. Uh, but I find tins in, in stores that, usually little knick-knack stores that sell greeting cards and stuff. I'll often find a, a tin in there that's maybe used for something else. And then I'll just use whatever that is, whether it's sweets or whatever. And, uh, and put the pencils in there. So I've got lots of nice little old-fashioned pencil cases uh, that I keep. <laughs> I've said the word again, cases. Pencil tins, let's call them. All right, so I'm using, uh, once again, the General's uh, pencil to get some detail. And you can see there that I used the detail hand for the first time. Or I think it was for the first time. You know, I'm, I'm hopefully working uh, so fluidly and intuitively here that I don't notice. But I quickly flipped it back over to get the gestural hand, because the gestural hand is much more important to me. So I often have a little danger bell go off if I'm working with the detail hand. I go, watch where you are here, pal. And don't stay there too long. It's a dangerous place to be, because then you start, your drawing will start to stiffen up. And so that's not where I want to be. And you can see now, as the drawing progresses, we have become, in the you know the words of the great Steve Houston, we've become acquainted uh, with the with the model. And I'm luckier than you guys because I'm well acquainted uh, with the model. I've drawn Alana many times and painted her as well. It's just a terrific model. And on that subject as well, when you find a good model, you know, you know, just hang on to them. You know, I don't know if Lana won't be doing this forever, so I try to hire as much as I can. And uh, it can make the difference between a, a great painting and a mediocre painting, the model. And I don't mean just the actual shape of the model, that's important too, but the gestural nature of the model. So Alana is basically starting my gesture off because she's already gestural in her poses. She does yoga. She practices uh, a healthy lifestyle, and she dances around, and she's really very fluid. And so, uh, as is Katie, who you'll draw as well. So, I found after years of trial and error that models from a model agency are actually n no good to me at all. I prefer an actress or a dancer, and if we can get both, which I'm lucky to have, which is dancers and actors. Uh, performance um, artists are really good models. So if you know anyone, uh, friends that are performance artists, maybe ask them if they would like to pose. And and you never know, they might be you know your your next great um, leap forward 
and that you have something terrific to work with rather than you know trying to crib something from the internet or or that kind of uh, sort of really we have to do it sometimes I guess when we're starting out when I started out I had to you know draw models from books and stuff but if you could you know when you're a band of artists for instance who use each other as models which was always helpful to me when I had no money but uh, if you go to the live drawing classes and, and you gr meet a great model see if you can get together with some friends and and uh, and ask what the fee would be for you know maybe a bit of photography and they'll tell you you know that's what they do not all but find out usually with an agency and at this current time this is 2018 uh, I think the price is for photography around 75 uh, Australian dollars whatever that equates to in, in other worlds and you know I've found that basically models are around 35 dollars um, generally and for a live draw session it's 15 dollars uh, worldwide which is odd so it's 15 dollars here in Australia and 15 dollars in, in the US for a live drawing session uh, so if you change that into currency it would be much more expensive in America to draw a model okay so working with um, a paper stump now and a paper stump is a terrific a terrific uh, little tool that you really want to be careful of as well so everything has its dangers and everything has its uh, pluses and the danger here is that it's too smooth and we might get into airbrush territory here and I've seen artists work 100 hour drawings uh, 200 hour drawings with this stump as a constant smooth um, tool that seduces us into thinking we can get a photographic finish which is what you can get using that tool but my idea is I don't want that I don't want a photographic finish because uh, I want to express more than just what I see I want to express what I feel and the way to do that is to interpret what you have in front of you and once again Alana's given me so much to work with uh, that I I don't have to do much but with every line and every stroke I try to make it a little bit more gestural even as I'm working with the needle blue razor here I'm thinking it's gestural I'm even holding it gesturally uh, I want to draw with it and you might also notice that I haven't used the eraser once uh, for corrections it's always been for drawing with so on that note uh, that's what I teach I teach how to learn to draw based on relationships rather than measuring a string or thumb and not that there's anything wrong with that but it's just not what I do and it means that the artwork is, is for me it works much more fluidly and I'm always going forward that's the philosophy behind that is that I'm always going forward and if we use the eraser to erase um, something you know that we want to change then it's a negative feeling right away in our minds we're going this is a mistake I've just made a mistake and I'm gonna fix it whereas I'm always thinking about here I'm going forward with highlights that's what I'm thinking of and if I have to erase something I mean you know what's gonna happen some at some point I'll try and erase gesturally at least and if something really is a big big fix you know like you had to move an entire leg into a different position then you're best to just draw the whole thing again as far as I'm concerned to keep that gestural flow going so if you go back in time and see that little adjustment I made to that leg it was done at the very early stages when that was not a problem so step back at the early stages like you did see me do earlier there or there was a pause where there was nothing happening on screen that was me standing back and really looking at the decisions I need to make uh, to go forward so step back often especially when you're starting out and forever as well I mean just but do it more often when you're starting out step back and you'll be really surprised how easy it is to see the errors compared to being too close so I'm using the chamois here to soften off those edges that had the needable eraser on them because the needable eraser is quite hard but I like to keep it that way you can see that this is um, you know that's very very clear to see what those highlights should be 
and so it makes it easier for me to put in complicated anatomy like the trapezius there wobbling across the top of the scapula. It's that big sort of Z shape there that I've just put in. And if everything's too soft, it's harder to judge the the shapes, the interlocking shapes. If they all become soft, it's harder to find out exactly where they are and how they relate to each other. So I like to relate them in a, a very obvious manner to begin with and then soften the edges. I learned that from Boris Vallejo. You know, put it all in there, do your due diligence, and then soften the edges. If we work with just soft from the get-go, then everything gets very woolly. In fact, we had a term for that in my younger days in the advertising agencies. Uh, in the studio of artists, we had a studio of artists, and they called them woolly artists, the artists that didn't commit to, you know, hard shadows and hard highlights. And uh, everything was soft. You know, like this drop shadow on the right hand side there coming off the arm. I'm deliberately sharpening it more, even that it is in real life, because it, it makes a pop. It makes the dimension more dimensional. So you'll see, think about on a summer's day, how clear everything is, how crystal clear forms are because of the hard shadows. The hard shadows carve out forms especially if you look at a statue on a, on a summer's day, look at a statue. And then look at the same thing, or you know, as, a good, uh, as an experiment actually, you could take a photograph of a statue with the full sun on it, and then take a photograph of a statue in an overcast day, and have a look at the difference in, in clarity. So overcast days, even though they show more local color, true color, you know, a blue on an overcast day is a more accurate blue than on a, on a hot day sunny day but things become a little softer all round you start to lose the drop, sh drop shadows and so the drop shadows are our friend as far as d dimension is concerned I mean just look how carved out that uh, calf looks now with the drop shadow of the other foot falling across it and back to <laughs> I didn't promise anything's easy but think about what we talked about earlier, which was always be thinking. Always be thinking, even when you do the drop shadows, uh, that the drop shadow is also dropping over the top of another form. And so it has to not only be the shape of the arm, for instance, here, but also the shape of the gluteus, or whatever the other form is, as it falls onto it. And so be very aware of that, especially if you, like me, you add shadows, you pretend or make shadows up. That's your, your first call, is to make sure that you understand that the, the form it's landing on is also a shape, and that's going to change the shape of the shadow. So those three shadows are really coming together now, and you can see how I'm working without the mid-tones uh, so much now. Mid-tones are a nice broad idea, but going from the darkest value to the lightest value is a much easier way to see form and you can see we're starting to really see especially on the gluteus there look at the at the occlusion shadow where flesh meets flesh and how much that carves that that gluteus out and then you can get it, come back in later and put more stuff in you know more grace but I'm trying to work on a three value system as long as I can so that means the darkest dark the lightest light and the midtone something in between and then we can start putting other uh, variations of those darks uh, in. So at the minute now we're looking at the darkest dark, the lightest light, and a little bit of value uh, in the middle. So I'm using a uh, chamois here, and that's the chamois leather from the car uh, shop. Remember it has to be leather. And wash it, get the oil out, and then it's a great soft tool. You don't get them in the art stores, by the way. It's a great soft tool, uh, even softer than tissue paper, and it'll take a lot of stuff off, especially on a, a fragile surface like this. If you start digging in with an eraser, you probably cut a hole into it. But uh, this little chamois is so soft it just glides across, and you can either take a lot of charcoal off, or a soft amount, and it's really good for textures too. If your touch is a little heavy, 
You can use fixative at any point. But if you are, use a workable fixative. A reworkable fixative. That means you can, it doesn't hold as hard as a, as a final fixative. And that way you won't be messing up your artwork so much, dirtying it up. And, uh, but you see I use just a sheet of paper to keep that clean as long as possible. Now notice how I'm still thinking of the values uh, as a balance and by bringing some light into that shadow it gives the impression of a, a sunnier day. Uh, shadows are very dark um, on an overcast day even though they're softer or very dark if you're indoors for instance. So I want to get the feeling that this is an outdoor set. And rather than it being in the studio like it is, thinking about how would the light behave on in the outdoors. And the shadows uh, tend to be lighter as they fall away from the form. Well, they are as they fall away from the form. And they get tighter and darker as they get closer to the form. So I'm looking for the darkest darks here. And once again, they're the occlusion shadows, where flesh meets flesh. And you can see me flipping the general's pencil over and over uh, all the time in case I get too pernickery, get too detailed. So I'm really starting to think about the finish here now. Uh, and that means using all the tools. I usually end up with a handful of everything, you know, a needable eraser, a pencil, a stump, tissue paper, on and on. Uh, and it <laughs> becomes a bit cumbersome sometimes. So when you see that classical picture of an artist with all their all their brushes in their hand, it's not just a pose. That's how we end up near the end. So here I'm working with uh, tighter tools, and you can think about big to small here. You know, what were the biggest tools? The biggest tool was the the um, the original charcoal stick, and now we're down to tiny stuff. And the big needable eraser. Now we're down to a little, little mono eraser. And those mono erasers are just little pencil, thin sometimes. Erasers fit into a pen uh, holder. Like I say, I'm going back and forth here with the stump as well. I'm putting in the hard. Um, core lines here to begin with and then I'll soften them off. So the hard lines are not going to remain that hard. I'm going to soften them obviously and but look at the dimension now we've got again uh, just by thinking like that, thinking about that corner of the form. It's the corner of the form where it turns around. And that's that dimensional idea again that the form is turning around a corner. So I think of the core shadow like a corner, rather than a core. You know, a core is a, an abstract idea, but a corner isn't. We can we can understand that. So I think of it like that. And then I'm going to go in with uh, various tools again. And that's back to one of my uh, ideas in art, which is just basically back and forth. We're going back and forth in a much more uh, instinctive way now. What what do we need here and there? You know, the stump, the uh, eraser, fingers, everything goes in now at this point. Because at this point we really are truly, truly uh, acquainted with this figure. And so, and you saw me earlier use a, a brush to brush away debris, because you don't want to be brushing away with your hand at this point. You might just smudge the whole drawing. And that brush was on the end of a a pencil eraser. So you can buy a little, little eraser that's pencil shaped and has a brush on the back of it. And they're they're great to use. You know, you can just erase and then flip it over and, and brush away some stuff. So back and forth uh, with the stump. Now at this stage you've got to be very, very careful that you don't fall into the trap of staying in one place too long and starting to render. Uh, render the point where you've forgotten what the overall picture is. The overall picture should always be in your mind and that's why I step back so often. I want to make sure that the brightest part is the gluteus 
and nothing can be brighter than that. You know, that's that's the focus at this point. Like I say, the gluteus is very the gluteus is very dimensional. And so that's gonna be the focus here. Could be a head in another picture. Could be a hand. Like I say, you can see now that I've collected a little bunch of stuff there in my other hand. I'm right handed so I keep it all in the left hand. And I can then al alternate between each of these tools without having to reach for them. So getting very gestural here. And um, getting these dark darks in. So the darker we put something in, the lighter light appears. Uh, it seems obvious. But sometimes people don't think like that. They just go from top to bottom and do the same value range all the way down. It's the placement of a dark next to a light that makes it lighter. And so those very darks under the gluteus make the light above very light. And that's what creates dimension. And so and also draws our eye too. Our eye is drawn toward a contrast. And if everything's in contrast then it becomes a headache to look at. So along with structure and gesture we have another thing to consider and that's uh, composition and composition you know if you think about it in its basic form is you draw a bowl of fruit and you put the apple and banana in a nice position where I you know relaxes here and there and that's what classic composition is but for me composition composition is also um, tone uh, you know if we put a grayer tone somewhere and a darker tone somewhere else, then we're composing the picture. We're, we're taking your eye from what's a softer value down to a darker and broader value uh, range. So we're actually composing the picture to have your eye move toward the contrast. And uh, like music, you know, we're always looking for or listening for a rhythm and we're listening for a focal. Uh, point where we want to hear the crescendo at the end not at the start mind you there's some <laughs> really bad musicians that start with a crescendo at the start and those little uh, you know somebody's got talent shows they come out screaming right away because uh, that's what the audience seems to want but uh, you know enduring music doesn't start like that it starts think of a bolero it starts quiet and builds to a big climax so I think of the art like that too. We slowly build up to this uh, rhapsody, uh, this point where everything is, is wild and contrasty, instead of um, beating people in the head with it to begin with. So we start soft, and then we gradually get more and more contrasted. And you can see also I'm bringing in all the swirl, uh, all the energy of the beginning of the of the story of this picture. Uh, you often hear the word story in art. It doesn't necessarily mean a beginning and an end of a of a drama, but the story in this picture is you know it's all about balance. It's all about contrast. That's the story. So. Uh, apart from that, what traditionally is known as the story is is what's what's the picture, what's it about? And for me, this picture has a title now. It's it's called the entity, and um, and with a vague title like that, rather than a woman walks down the street as a title, or a woman skips through the park as a title, by giving it an ambiguous title like the entity, we create a conversation with the viewer. And the viewer asks, "What is this entity that we talk about? Is it is it the is it the figure, or is it the swirly mist, or what is it? Is it something inside or outside? Uh, you know, what is it?" And by leaving things vague, we give the viewer a chance to interpret the the art, and that's the art of conversation. And the art of conversation is very important to me that we don't spell everything out, and that's what's so great about art. It's it doesn't bash you over the head when it's great. It it makes you think, and by thinking our way through this, we have a conversation with the artist, and that's one of the beautiful things I love looking at art, and thinking about the artist that created it and what they were thinking. 
So you can think that they'd, now that we're done, that that entity is that swirl of mist. Uh, you know, I've created that uh, <laughs> to make you feel that too, if you want to. It's up to you. All right, guys. So looking forward to seeing you in the next installment. Uh, these eight weeks are, are they're great fun for me, and I hope they are uh, for you as well in our journey through art in the form of charcoal and pencil. Okay, and I'll see you next time. Uh, good luck with your own art, guys.